treat other people the way you want to feel. Treat other people like your friends. Make them smile and laugh and you'll be smiling too. Just follow the good old golden rule. There is a golden rule out there for us to follow. It's kind of like a road to happiness. If I be nice to you and you be nice to me, we can live our lives in peace and harmony. Treat other people the way you want to feel. Treat other people like your friends. Make them smile and laugh and you'll be smiling too. Just follow that good old golden rule. The golden rule will work when you are wandering. The golden rule works wonders when you're home. It'll keep on working great for you. The golden life for a whole life to wherever. like your friends make them smile and laugh and you'll be smiling too just follow that good old golden rule make them smile and laugh and you'll be smiling too just follow that good old golden rule Thank you to Chris Geisha for finding the perfect song for this service. <laughs> and, and for Chris and Barb for performing. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Utica. I'm Glenn Coyne. I'm a member of the uh, worship committee here, and I'm your MC for today's ceremonies. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter what faith you bring, no matter what convictions and doubts and thoughts and joys and concerns you bring to this service, you're welcome here. Whatever you seek today, whatever message you are hoping to receive, you are welcome here. No matter who you love, no matter who you are, no matter how you identify, you are welcome here. Every single part of every one of you is welcome here this morning. And I am ecstatic to see all the faces. This is my favorite thing to do is to give the welcome and to see all the faces of everyone who's come in this very cold morning to be with us this morning. We have one announcement. Um, Jack. Hi, this is just a reminder of the uh, potluck that's going to be immediately following the uh, uh, cluster service next week. We need um, volunteers to bring in food, and there's a sign-up sheet right outside the sanctuary. If, uh, if you're online and not here, you can uh, always text or email me, and I will add you to the list. We also need uh, volunteers to come in and help, uh, help set up. So if anybody's interested in doing that, you know, coming half an hour early or something like that, uh, please contact me also. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. My second favorite thing is the cluster services. I love seeing all the other, all the other UU members from around the central New York. Um, we acknowledge that the land in which this church is built uh, was the ancestral lands of the United Indian Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee um, tri Confederacy, which um, lived in these lands since time immemorial. Let us now open our hearts to the wisdom of love and the spirit of community. Our call to worship this morning comes from the words of um, Robin Wall Kimmerer in her brilliant book, Abrading Sweetgrass. If you haven't read it, it is a revelation. 
Um, I just read it last year, and it is, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Cultures of gratitude must also be cultures of reciprocity. Each person, human or no, is bound to every other in a reciprocal relationship. Just as all beings have a duty to me, I have a duty to them. If an animal gives its life to feed me, I am in turn bound to support its life. If I receive a stream's gift of pure water, then I am responsible for returning a gift in kind. An integral part of a human's education is to know these duties and how to perform them. Now we'll, we'll sing our first hymn, hymn 127, Can I See Another's Woe? You are welcome to stand as you are willing and able. Good morning, my name is Kim Bywater. Our chalice lighting today are words by Adam Slate. We gather this morning as one community, a community united by common ideals, love, justice, diversity, freedom, mutual care, and equity. Yet look around look at the faces of those around you each face represents an individual every one of us with our own story needs strengths and faults we light our chalice today honoring our common connection and also the uniqueness that lives within each of us Good morning. So I'm so excited about the golden rule, do unto otters. <laughs> so I picked the perfect book, Do Unto Otters, a book about manners by Lori Keller. That's what we're talking about, right? <laughs> So we are hopping along with our rabbit. Hello, Mr. Rabbit. We're your new neighbors, the otters. Otters. Otters? My new neighbors are otters? I don't know anything about otters. What if we don't get along? Here, our rabbit thinks. He will say, pesky otters, and they will say, lousy rabbit. <laughs> Mr. Rabbit, I know an old saying. Do unto otters as you would have otters do unto you. What does that mean? 
It simply means treat otters the same way you'd like otters to treat you. Treat otters the same way I'd like otters to treat me? Hmm. How would I like otters to treat me? How would I like otters to treat me? Well, I'd like otters to be friendly, a cheerful hello, a nice smile, and good eye contact are all part of being friendly. Friendliness is very important to me, especially after my last neighbor, Mrs. Grrr. I'd like otters to be polite. They should know when to say please. Yoo-hoo, Mr. Rabbit, would you please return my ball there? Pretty please with carrots on top. Say the magic word and I'll turn these clams into a million dollars. The magic word rhymes with cheese. <laughs> they should know when to say thank you. I can say thank you in five languages. Gracias, merci, danke schon, arigato, ankhe uye. Wait, did you say please or cheese? And they should know when to say, excuse me. Oh, Mrs. Otter, excuse me, B. I need to run and check on something. Excuse me for interrupting your reading, but I heard you say please, not cheese. Otters should be honest. That means they should keep their promises. My word is as good as goldfish. Not lie, I never lie, it makes my whiskers itch. And not cheat, cheating makes my whiskers itch too. I'd like otters to be considerate. You know, being a good listener, asking before borrowing something, not littering, being patient, caring for all creatures big and small, opening the door for someone, being on time, respecting the elderly, helping neighbors untangle ears. It's always good to have a considerate neighbor. It wouldn't hurt otters to be kind. Everyone appreciates a kind act, no matter how bad it smells. Like if the otter is giving you a fish bouquet. Oh, and what's that word? Cooperate. Otters should learn to cooperate. Cooperate to work well together. We know how to cooperate. <laughs> I like to. I see otters like to play. I hope they know how to play fair. Otters rules for fair play. Be a good sport, play by the rules, take turns, include everyone, even bees. <laughs> well, you have to include the bees, Nancy. I'd like it if we could share things. Our favorite books like Harry Otter and Goldilocks and the Three Hares. Our favorite activities like Otter Totter and Go Fish. Our favorite treats, maybe not the treats. <laughs> Unless you like carrot pizza or fish ice cream. I hope otters won't tease me about my doot de doo song, my extra large swim fins, my bad hair days. I hope otters won't tease anyone about anything. Teasing is mean, it's the worst. It's worse than having a clam snap shut on your nose. I think otters should apologize when they do something wrong. I'm sorry I used your ear as a tissue. <laughs> and I hope they can be forgiving when I do something wrong. I'm sorry I called you snotter. So there, that's how I'd like otters to treat me. You see, Mr. Rabbit, I told you it was simple. Right, just doot de do unto otters as you would have otters doot de do unto you.
the end. <laughs> so do want to honor, oh, thank you, by Lori Keller. There's a little bit more text in this book. I'll have it in the back if you want to check it out after the service. That was perfect, thank you. Uh, my wife and I went to uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium a year ago, and she now has an otter mug. We have an otter bag. We have we have otter, and many otter otter things. So. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. So, the poster on the back of your program, which um, I realize when you shrink it down to half of eight and a half by eleven, becomes awfully tiny print. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I will read some of it for you. So um, anyway, this, you might have seen this poster. It uh, it's, pops up in churches around the, uh, around the world. I know the UU Church in Barneville has a similar one. Um, this one that I did not violate copyright for, because you can get it for free, is from the World Association of Churches. Um, it's a poster that was distributed by um, Brent Abramson and Fred Smith. That's what they call the Teacher's Press. And, and they wrote a short curriculum on using the golden rule for kids. Uh, they make the point that the golden rule is a worldwide ethical standard uh, that can be used as a sole foundation for an effective ethical code. Um, I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, about whether that's enough. But we know that the golden rule does appear in, strip, in scriptures around the world, and it is a universal form of how we treat each other. So how did we get here? How did this simple golden rule and its variations that we'll talk about come to be seen as the foundation for the world's major religions. And is it really the best that we can do as a moral law? I would argue, and I will argue, that the golden rule is a good first step. Um, but as an ethical standard of how to treat people or otters and rabbits, um, in a world of diversity, it falls a bit short. Uh, and, and we can aspire for more. <clears throat> So before we delve into that, I want to give some credit uh, and a big thank you to Reverend Erica Barron, a UU minister who now uh, is at the UUA uh, corporate. Um, and she had this idea well before me. And so I, I had been kicking around this idea of a service on the golden rule, um, but my thoughts didn't really fully gel. I guess you'll determine whether they did or not in a few minutes. Um, until our Reverend, our minister, Reverend Karen Brammer, sent me along a sermon that Reverend Erica Barron had done about 10 years ago. Uh, I'll be using some of uh, her insights and um, attributing to her some specific language, uh, which I think really uh, helps uh, identify what the golden rule is and isn't. Uh, so, so let's take a look at the poster. I know it's kind of tiny print. Um, but you'll see that, that many of the world's religions from Baha'i to Zoroastrianism um, use some version of the golden rule. You know, treat others as you would want them to be treated. Um, there are some variations on this that we'll talk about um, and significant differences, I think, in what they compel us to do and how they ask us to treat each other. Um, but let me read some of these aloud. Um, Baha'i, lay not on any soul a load that you would not wish to be laid upon you and desire not for anyone the things you would not desire for yourself. Hinduism, this is the sum of duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if it was done to you. Buddhism, treat not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Confucianism, one word which sums up the basis of all conduct, loving kindness. Do not do to others as you would have them done to you. Christianity, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Taoism, regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain, and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. Uh, this one they call native spirituality, which I have a little bit of trouble with because there are thousands of different native spiritualities that we could draw from. But anyway. We are as much alive as we keep the earth alive. Zoroastrianism, do not do unto others whatever is injurious to yourself. Jainism, one should treat all creatures in the world as one would like to be treated. Judaism, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole Torah, all the rest is commentary. 
Not one of you truly believes until you wish for, I'm sorry, Islam. Not one of you truly believes until you wish for others what you wish for yourself. Now, Unitarian Universalism makes this poster at the bottom. It's called Unitarianism, so it's fairly pre-merger. Um, and it quotes the seventh principle. We affirm and promote the interdependent web of existence of which we are a part. Now, I would say that you could also equally use our second, first principle, that we um, affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. But as usual, you use have to make everything complicated. Um, so the first, I think one of the first variations on, on this theme of the, of the, the poster is whether they're positively or negatively stated. We probably saw that or heard that. In other words, do they ask us not to do things that we would not want done to us? Or do they ask us positively to do the things to others that we would have done to us? And we'll see there's a big difference in that. Um, the negative version is sort of about not doing something. And it's much more common. Uh, most of these on that sheet and most of what I read, in fact, do use sort of the negative version, which is don't cause harm if you don't want that harm caused to you. And then there are Jainism and Christianity and a couple others that say, beyond that, do to others what you would want done to you. So, and we have also versions that ask us to consider, all the versions ask us to consider other human beings and our ethical decision making. Um, they ask us to make decisions based not on only on our own needs and wants, but also by considering the needs and the wants of others. In a sense, they all ask us to have a certain degree of empathy, and they invite us to notice the worth and humanity of other people. Others are people too, and they have their, their feelings, their wants, and their needs. They're not simply objects that we can use. A care for others is the heart of the golden rule in all of these cases. But how did this simple principle with its variations come to be seen as the bedrock of so much philosophical and religious thought? Both Eastern and Western philosophies, which we know to have very different uh, outlooks, uh, also both rely on this very simple tenet. There's something fundamental about the golden rule that we'll explore, um, but there's also some shortcomings that we'll talk about. I start with the premise as a humanist, the con I believe the concept of God and religion was, in was invented to impose and maintain social order as societies grew beyond small tribal units. I believe that our morality comes not from God or from co some collection of gods, but from our evolution as a social species. Bonobos, our closest living primate relatives, routinely engage in recipro reciprocal behavior. They care for the sick and the old. They don't need a god or a rule or a rule. It's how they've evolved and it's how they've succeeded as a species. Bonobos have never lived the golden rule, have never read the golden rule, but they live it. Empathy, sympathy, reciprocity, fairness, and other basic tendencies were built into humanity's moral order based on our primate psychology says primatologist and author Franz de Waal, who studied primate behavior for years. We did not develop this order from scratch, but we had a huge helping hand, not God's, but Mother Nature's. So did our ancient hominid ancestors. There's a skull discovered, a 50,000 year old skull of a Neanderthal man who was probably in his late 40s, which is a long time to live uh, in those days. This skull revealed that not only did this person suffer severe injury, at some point in his life that it healed, but also was probably deaf. A person like that does not survive on its own in, it, without help from others. So it's clear that even our ancient ancestors, long before we could codify or write down the golden rule, practiced it to some degree. So this ancient principle is not a human invention, but a collective natural one. Homo sapiens just happened to be the ones who invented writing to put it down. The first written version of the golden rule is probably from Confucius, who lived more than 500 years before Jesus. Confucius wrote, do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. When asked if there was one word to guide one's life, Confucius replied, reciprocity. By the way, philosophers, instead of using the term golden rule, use ethic of reciprocity. You can see why golden rule stuck and not that one. 
So here's another reason I think why the golden rule has found itself at the center of so many religions. It's simple, um, perhaps deceptively so. But religions, for good and for ill, try to influence the behavior of their followers. And as humans, we are more likely to follow concise, easy to follow directions. The Ten Commandments fit on two tablets. Um, the golden rule is both easy to remember and poetic in its repetition. As we talked about before, the golden rule has a couple of variants, and I want to talk about those. Don't do what you don't want done, do what you do want done. The negative version I have seen called the silver rule. Um, Reverend Barron argues that the difference between the, the silver and golden rules are more different than they appear on, sur on the surface. And she says, consider the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, if you remember, a man is robbed and beaten and left to die by the side of the road. And two, mem two members of, of uh, you know, well, uh, well-respected societies walk past him and do nothing. The third person, the Samaritan, who is looked down upon, an outcast, stops to help. So Reverend Barron says, it's clear that the robbers had broken both the positive and negative versions of the classic golden rule by actively doing to someone what would be harmful if done to them. And it is clear that the good Samaritan has followed both versions of the rule. The question is whether the two who passed without offering aid have acted in accordance with either version of the golden rule. The two who passed by and did not do what they would want done for them, but they also did not cause harm. They were not the robbers. So we might argue that they have actually kept the negatively stated version of the golden rule. They did not do, they did not cause more harm. I would argue that an ethic based on not causing harm is not the same as an ethic based on doing what one would want done. Now, living in a culture in which the dominant religion is Christianity, we're probably most familiar with the positive version of the golden rule as articulated by Jesus in the book of Matthew. In the King James Version, Jesus says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus was the most quotable um, proponent of the golden rule, but in fact, he was kind of just updating the Old Testament. The book of Leviticus tells us that you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which I guess, falls apart a little bit if you don't love yourself. But um, So how does the golden rule stack up as a foundation of a moral code? Many people have found it lacking for the reasons I've talked about. And the golden rule, I think, ultimately makes morality about you, what you would want or what you would not want. It's self-focused, but I think also somewhat self-centered. Why assume others want what you want? And does it mean that if you don't want something that someone else wants, you have no obligation to get it for them? DeWall, the, the primatologist I mentioned before, maintains the golden rule has a fatal flaw. It assumes that all people are alike, DeWall argues. It works only if all people are of the same age, sex, and health status, with similar preferences and aversions. Since we don't live in such a world, the rule really isn't as useful as it sounds. Humanist writer A.C. Grayling makes a similar point. We should not apply the golden rule because others might not share one's interest and taste, and one might not understand theirs. Yet those legitimate criticisms aside, there's a reason the golden rule has persisted and permeated every moral code. It's an important start. It does compel us to consider others. It requires us to keep others in our decision making. It pricks our moral consciences to realize that even as we are the centers of our own universe, other people are the center of theirs. But as the Wall and Graying suggest, maybe we can do better. We can expand our morality beyond ourselves and be aware of what others want. You might have heard of, the, of what's called the platinum rule. Do unto others as they would have done unto them. Now that flips everything around. Now it's no longer about you, about what you would desire, about what you would want, but about the legitimate needs and desires of that person that you're trying to treat well. The platinum rule consider, requires us not just to consider others, but to understand them. It compels us to do things we might not want to do because it's what the other person wants done. 
I think the platinum rule comes closer to that ancient call of Leviticus. Not just to treat others as you would be treated, but to love thy neighbor as thyself. That's different than just doing something for someone else. It requires us to love them. And love requires understanding. So that's a whole different perspective and one that requires a lot more work on our part. What does that person want? How can we find that out? What does it obligate us to do? I would argue it requires us to ask questions, to listen. It requires us to confront our own prejudices, our own assumptions, and not, and not apply them to others. It requires us to leave our comfort zones and inhabit the, com the comfort zone of someone else, even if that makes us uncomfortable. I, can, I think of the platinum rule as, as also applying to other species as the Jainist and the UU um, quotes on this poster hint. If I obeyed the golden rule while walking my dog, I would walk a mile and never stop. But if I obey the platinum rule, we stop every 30 seconds. <laughs> while my dog sniffs some highly desirable scent in the grass. It's a scent I cannot detect nor decipher, but I can try to understand why an animal with an exquisite sense of smell would find it so enticing. One time, my wife and I were walking the dog, and I got impatient because she stopped yet again. And my wife said, just think of it as you reading The New Yorker. <laughs> so I, I'm not tossing out the golden rule. It's an important foundation. And there's a real reason it is and has, will continue to be the baseline for so many moral codes. But it's not enough. I argue that we should go above and beyond. We should think of our New Yorker and our dog sniffing and understand that when we apply that to others, whether they're humans or animals, our needs, our desires are not the ones we need to truly consider when treating others, but theirs. I want to close with a passage from that sermon by Reverend Barron that helped me so much with this one. In a context in which acts of violence and vengeance are commonplace, the version of the golden rule that asks us to refrain from harming others in ways we would not want to be harmed can be radical and very necessary. In contexts in which there is widespread passivity in the face of injustice, oppression, or harm, the call to actively do for others what we would want done for us can be a clarion call for action. In a context in which actions are undertaken to satisfy a certain understood standard of behavior, but in which people do not feel connected on a deeper level, the version which asks us to love one another as ourselves can bring us closer together. And in an increasingly multicultural world, the version that asks us to treat others according to their own desires, not ours, rather than assuming that everyone feels the way they do, is a new and important challenge. Thank you. And now we'll sing hymn number 121, We Will Build a Land, We'll Build a Land. Um, stand and if you are willing and able. Oh, no. 
anointed my God may then create peace where justice shall roll down like waters and peace like a never flowing stream we'll be a land building up ancient cities raising up devastations from mold restoring ruins of generations oh we'll build a land of people so bold come build a land where sisters and brothers anointed by god may then create peace where justice shall roll down like waters and peace like a never flowing stream come build a land where the mantles of praises resound from spirits both faint and once weak where like oaks of righteousness stand her people oh come build the land my people we seek come build a land where sisters and brothers anointed by god may then create peace where justice shall roll down like waters and peace like an Thank you. Last week, last week while we sat in church, a big snow squall came through and dropped a couple of inches of snow on us. And if you notice, the parking lot is clear. Today, it's about seven degrees outside, and we are warm and dry inside. And the reason is because all the generosity of the congregation allows us to keep a roof and snow plows and makes it real so that we can all come into this physical space and have our spiritual experience. So now we're gonna take an offering. And, and if please be as generous as your heart and, and wallet allows to support the work of this church. <laughs> the offertory music today, we're gonna to ask you to be participating in. And you can participate by giving us a good clap. But there's also another part which in circles are called uh, call and response. So I will sing out something, and you've got to sing it back. And Barb will help you with that. So first we're going to get started with the clapping. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Got one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You got to put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. One foot in front of the other and lead with love don't give up hope don't give up hope you're not alone you're not alone don't you give up don't you give up keep moving on keep moving on you gotta put one foot in front of the other and deal with love one foot in front of the other and lead with love you gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love put one foot in front of the other and lead with love lift up your eyes lift up your eyes you're not alone you're not alone look up ahead look up ahead the path is there. The path is there. You gotta put, put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. One foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other 
and lead with love. I know you're scared. I know you're scared. And I'm scared too. And I'm scared too. But here I am. But here I am. Right next to you. Right next to you. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. One foot in front of the other and lead with love. Last time you gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. One foot in front of the other and lead with love. We will now extinguish our chalice. Please read along with me the words in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the What's light of music, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. Our closing words come from John C. Morgan. Let us bless and keep one another. Let kindness rule in our hearts and compassion in our lives until we meet again. Amen. Since you all did such a great job with your clapping last time, we're going to ask you to do it again <laughs> on this song. And there is a kind of repeating chorus if you want to join in. Uh, you'll pick it up right away, so I'm not going to go over it as a separate part, but you'll pick it up. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little high, but go ahead. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Some longer Ooh, I believe in the power of love. We don't know what's coming, but we can help shape what's ahead. With kindness as our currency, the wealth is in our hands. So give a little, give a little, give a lot, don't stop. Hey, a helping hand makes the world go round. There's more than enough. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Look up Look now, people. Keep your ears to the ground. We, we are, are the, the river, river flowing where generosity abounds. So give a little, give a little, give a lot, don't stop. A helping hand makes the world go round. There's more than enough. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Uh, uh. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. The honeybee serves sweetness to help the world bloom. Bring love to the flower, from the flower to the fruit. We could all learn a thing or two. So give a little, give a little, give a lot, don't stop. A helping hand makes the world go round. There's more than enough. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. 
Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love.